All right. First thing we'll do is the, the review quiz. And some of these come right out of the text and others you just have to know. But what's, what's the year? In, in what year B.C. did Belshazzar 539, put 539 B.C. in that blank. In 539 B.C., King Belshazzar, who was the blank of King Nabonidus, what was he in relation to Nabonidus? He was the son, son of Nabonidus. Held a blank in the city of Babylon. Feast, had a feast. He brought out the blanks which had earlier been taken from the blank in blank. That's a lot of blanks. Brought out the vessels, cups, goblets, whatever they might have been. No detailed description, but they were apparently for drinking because that's what they used them for. They're taken from the temple in Jerusalem. The vessels that came out of the temple in Jerusalem. Thank you, John. We got plenty, plenty left back there? All right. Let's see here. Number two, as they were drinking, a blank appeared and wrote a message on the blank. A hand appeared, wrote a message on the wall. You don't even have to study Daniel to know that, do you? Since no one there could interpret it, the blank advised Belshazzar to call for blank. The queen advised Belshazzar to call for Daniel. Daniel interpreted the message to mean that the days of King Belshazzar had been, the word is numbered, days had been numbered. He had been weighed in the balance and found wanting. His kingdom would be taken from him and given to the, the Medes and the Persians. Medes and the Persians. That very night, this is number four, Belshazzar was blanked and Babylon fell. He was killed. Number five, several ancient sources outside the Bible correspond with the Bible account. One of these is, and I don't know why he just asked for one, but there were a couple given. Name one of the ones that were given. Extra biblical sources. One would be Herodotus. <clears throat> Herodotus, and I would choose Herodotus because it's easier to spell than Xenophon. Uh, Xenophon is X. E N O P H O N. Moms did not care what was going to happen when their kids went to school back in Greece, ancient times. What's your name again? I'll call you Zeni. Yeah. I know if he was born today, that's how it would work, but. Number six, the prophet blank foretold many details of the fall of Babylon. What's, what was the prophet? You remember who we talked about last week? That was Jeremiah, prophet Jeremiah. And he did that about 50 years before it actually happened. A lot of prophecies we see happen hundreds, in some cases, thousands of year before they, years before they take place. But, but Jeremiah's prophecy was for the people who were there. It's recorded for us so we can see what he told them, but they were the ones who needed to hear about what was going to happen within that 50-year time period. Just like when Jesus said, within a generation, this generation shall not pass until what? Until you see the kingdom of God being established and until... You see Jerusalem surrounded by armies and it falling and the temple being dismantled stone by stone. Uh, that's, that's what prophecy is for to some degree, to foretell the future. But prophecy is also simply to make sure people know what the word of God is. 
It's not always telling what's coming in the future. Sometimes it's just a word from God, a word of instruction. All right. We will do the worksheet for chapter 6 shortly, but first we will read chapter 6, so I need four readers. Yes, Larry. He wrote about Jerusalem. I, I don't know that he wrote about, I don't remember. Did we talk about that last week? I don't, I don't think it was Josephus. Right. I don't remember him doing that either, but you can get the index. If you ever want to do any research on Josephus, see what he wrote about, There's, his works come with an index, and it's just alphabetically organized. You can go back and see. You can look up Babylon. You can look up Nabonidus. You can look up Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar. Look up any name like that, and if it's in the index, it'll show you where to go to read about that. Uh, it's pretty handy. Well, don't let it happen again, okay? <laughs> uh, readers, that's what we were doing. One through nine. Who, all right. Doc's got one through nine, 10 to 15. Who wants to take 10 to 15? All right, Rich is in the back. Boy, Janie, I almost got you because you raised your hand to cover your mouth when you cough. Boy, I almost grabbed you. 16 to 24. There's another hand in the back. That's Mike. And then uh, 25 to 28, last, pi oh, you, you girls can fight over it. I'll, I'll give it to Lori, because you get to answer questions. <laughs> All right, let's read chapter 6 together of the book of Daniel. It seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom, that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom, and over them three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps might be accountable to them, and that the king might not suffer loss. Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit, and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Then the commissioners and satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs, but they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Then these men said, we will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. Then these commissioners, etc., came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as follows. King Darius, live forever. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects, the satraps, the high officials, and the governors have consulted together that the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man besides you <coughs> for 30 days shall be cast in the lion's den. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians which may not be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document that is the injunction. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now, in his roof chamber, he had windows open towards Jerusalem, that's in parentheses. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as he had been doing previously, then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. Then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Did you not, did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition <coughs> to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days is to be cast into the lion's den? The king replied, the statement is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Then they answered and spoke before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you sign, but keeps making his petition three times a day. Then as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel, and even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. 
Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Recognize, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or statute which the king establishes may be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I done any wrongdoing before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Right. Thank you all for reading. And all I can say is, wow. It's pretty, pretty hard times in a way when you think of any of this being applied to our present political situation. You know, people getting thrown into lion's dens, but not just them, their whole families. Pretty interesting the way things used to be. All right, let's... Fill in the blanks on the worksheet, and then we'll come back and, and talk about this sixth chapter and what's happening with Darius and Daniel and everybody else. All right, the date is now about, and there's no way you could know this from the text, but it's 538, 538 B.C. And the Medes and the blanks, Persians, are now in control. Daniel is one of blank high-ranking administrators. Well, he's, he's one of blank high-ranking administrators over blank satraps. So how many satraps were there? There were 120. So how many administrators were over them? Three. He's one of three administrators. The king is planning to promote Daniel over the blank kingdom. The whole kingdom, because he has such blank qualities, excellent qualities. And they all seem to come to the forefront through his service. So the king's planning to promote Daniel over the whole kingdom because he has such excellent qualities. Some of the other officials are opposed to this and contrive a blank against him, a plot. This is where, if, if there was a soundtrack, it would be going dun dun dun, because it was heavy stuff. They know of Daniel's prayer life, and so get the king to agree to publish a decree that anyone who prays to any blank or blank other than the king, any god or man other than the king, 
that's in the text, for blank days, 30 days, will be cast into a den of lions. Since Daniel regularly prayed blank times a day, three times a day with his window open toward blank, Jerusalem, he would either have to stop this practice or violate the king's decree. Daniel continues his customary prayer life. Number four, when Daniel's enemies report his violation, the king is blanked. What does the text say? The New American Standard says he is distressed. The king is distressed. By the way, do you remember the response of Nebuchadnezzar when it was reported to him that those were three Hebrew boys were not bowing down to his image? He was infuriated. That was his response, infuriated, until he saw inside, not the lion's den, but inside the fiery furnace, when they threw three guys in there, he looks and he sees four, and one like the Son of Man. And All right, back to our worksheet. The king is distressed, and he looks for a way out of sending Daniel to the lions. Not finding a way around the law, however, the king sends Daniel to the punishment, but says, may your God, whom you serve continually, blank you, rescue you. And all that's in the text. The king couldn't sleep and came early to check on Daniel. Daniel told him that his God had sent a blank to save him, an angel to save him, because he found Daniel to be blank in his sight, innocent. The king is, how does he respond? He's overjoyed. He is happy to see Daniel in good shape, and he takes Daniel out of the pit and throws into the pit those who contrive the plot along with their families. And the lions, after having been held back, broke all their bones, it says, before they even got to the bottom of the pit. What we have below in number five is kind of a chart we'll put together, the world empires and the people whom God sent to those empires. The first empire will be Egypt. Who'd God send to Egypt? He sent Moses. What was Moses at the time God sent him to Egypt? He was a shepherd. How old was he? An 80-year-old shepherd, and he gave him a huge, massive army to send down there to free the, Egypt, the Israelites from Egypt, right? What, what did he give him? He had a stick. Okay, we'll call it a staff, but basically a stick. Go down to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. And that's exactly what happened in the end. Pharaoh let those people go. Next nation or world empire is Assyria. Assyria. And you may not get this unless you're a bit of a history buff, but Jonah was the one sent to Assyria. What was the capital city of the Assyrians? Nineveh. And so Jonah was sent to Nineveh. And there were two things that we might call miracles. There's more than that in the, in the account. But what's the one we always think of with regard to Jonah? The being swallowed by the fish, the, the sea monster, the whale, whatever it was. What's the real miracle as far as I'm concerned? 120,000 people repent at Jonah's preaching. And he hated him. He hated him when he started. He hated him when he was finished. And they still repented at his preaching, which tells us the power is not in us. It's in the word. And so Jonah was sent to Nineveh. The next nation's Babylon. And who's sent to Babylon? But Daniel. And how was he sent? Well, he was taken into captivity, brought down into the nation, along with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And those four young men distinguished themselves by godly living and God's 
presence was with them and people could see that and they rose to prominent situations because that's what God had intended for them to do. And after Babylon, Medes and Persians, Daniel was also among them. But who else in history but Esther? Esther was also, and of course, if Esther's there, we've also got Mordecai. God always has people salting the earth. And that's what we're for today, is to salt the earth, to light the earth. Number six, some of Daniel's good qualities shown in this story. I hate to call it a story. I like to call it an account in this record. What are some of Daniel's qualities? What do you see? What stands out here? Oh, his prayer life, the committed prayer life. And you think about it. I know we've talked about this before, but if you're taken captive in your youth to a nation and your nation is destroyed, you might think that the God you served in the previous nation didn't care, didn't have anything to do with you anymore, and so you just, just give up. But these boys did not do that. They stayed faithful, perhaps because, and he quotes Jeremiah later, but I don't know if in their youth they might have known what Jeremiah had said. If they were listening and they heard uh, Jeremiah is saying we're going into captivity. Jeremiah is saying Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Jeremiah is saying in 70 years we're coming back. All right, boys, let's uh, hike up our britches and let's be prepared for some hard times and let's go do what we're supposed to do. Jeremiah had said when you get there, build houses. Let your kids get married. Raise your children. Have a garden. All the things that go along with life. And you just... Dig in and you seek the welfare of that nation because in 70 years I'm bringing you back. And if you seek the welfare of that nation, it'll be for your welfare as well. And that's exactly what God did and, and it's, it's unheard of. Not totally, but that a king would say, oh, you guys have been in captivity. How about we send you back to your city and rebuild it? And by the way, we'll pay for it. And then when people complained, the, the local people complained about uh, the, the Hebrews returning and rebuilding Jerusalem and the temple. Then the king said, well, in that case, you pay for it. You pay for what they're doing. It's a, it's, history's amazing when you really look at it and you see the hand of God as he's moved constantly to bring about good in the world. I hear something. Somebody had a... All right. Well, the quite of his work. They couldn't find errors in Daniel's work. They couldn't find any issues with it. He was faithful to the king and to his works. And so that's why they had to create a situation to you know, get rid of the competition. Right. That was the whole point of them trying to take him out. They were jealous. They, were, they saw him as a threat. And other than the lion's den, you know, I was only there two years. It's kind of like working at Tinker. You know, nothing's changed. It's the same, it's the same thing, you know. Nothing's new under the sun. Yeah. Does that, did that kind of thing ever happen to anybody else in the scriptures? What happened to Jesus? Same thing. Just, just almost the same pattern. We got we to gotta trip this guy up. Let's ask him some really hard questions and see if we can... Make it look like he's turned against Caesar. And even when they did that and he stumped them, so should we pay taxes to Caesar? <laughs> we'll get him on this one. And he says, hey, well, whose image is on that coin? Oh, Caesar's. Well, give to Caesar what belongs to him. Give to God what belongs to him. How more of a perfect answer could you offer? And still, that's one of the accusations they levied at Jesus when he was on trial. He, he told us not to pay taxes to Caesar. That's, it was all a lie. All a lie. I, the height of their blindness is that they witnessed him resurrect Lazarus from the dead. And they actually witnessed that. Right. Undeniable miracle that had just taken place. And the very first thing that they that comes to their mind is how are we going to kill this guy? Because you know these miracles are going to end up displacing us out of our position. All right. And kill him and we gotta kill Lazarus too. Yeah. It's like <laughs> crazy from the dead. You gotta get ah, it's it's insane. Back to what you were saying, Paul. When when you were talking about that, it reminded me of that text in Ephesians where Paul says, "Put on the whole armor of God and put on the breastplate of 
righteousness. If your life is showing forth righteousness, if you're trying to pattern yourself after Jesus Christ and, and people are able to see that in you, then that, that righteousness will protect you when people say things like, oh, that's so-and-so. They're this. Well, I've never seen them to be like that. or uh, that's I, No, there's no way that I would ever believe that about them, what you're telling me about them. That, that's your defense. And when God says uh, uh, righteousness will defend you, I don't think that's something that's just a practical aspect of the way things work in the world. I think that's something God stands behind. He's going to make sure if you live your life for me, and, and your life is reflecting the righteousness that I'm teaching you. I'll make sure that your righteousness protects you. At least that's, that's the principle that I see to, to some degree. I know there was another hand. Oh, Don? This isn't going to be real comfortable, but, um, you know, in the, in the Bible, I see politics throughout the Bible. I mean, right. There's always somebody evil in power hurting God's people, whether it's a nation against a nation, whether there's somebody in Jerusalem, 42 evil kings, eight, eight good ones always destroying God's people. You know, we see politics in Jesus' death. You know, the Pharisees were basically a political party. You know, they had, they had rule over people to, to, to uh, throw them in jail or do whatever. It's, and then the Romans, you know, that Pilate, you know, he, said he felt obligated to kill Jesus. Uh, written in Revelation. Um, Rome against the Christian, against the church. Well, that said, here we have this. I mean, I think the government, and this is my opinion, uh, duped us in 2020 to not gather together to say it's okay to do it online. And we bought into it because we're going to kill each other if we don't gather together. And I thought that was wrong then. I think it's wrong now. And I think that we should learn from that in the future that not to let the government or an evil government, and, and that's my opinion, that right now we got a government that's against Christianity and all the things they want to do. And that was, and I truly believe that. It's always about the church. You got to everything that everything that the government does. If it's an evil person, you know, they're trying to hurt the church, and I believe they were trying to hurt the church then, even though it didn't look like it. You know, uh, it looked like it was just for everybody. You know, everybody's safety. But you could tell the, the injustice they did with allowing some people to gather together and not some others. You know. So, right. Anyway, that's my view. On that. Well, and, and people can see through that that pattern that goes on in the world because who's the ruler of this world? And we know, we know Jesus has sovereign authority over everything in heaven and earth. But in this world, he said, he called the devil the ruler of this world. And in this world, he has a certain amount of sway, just like God gave him a certain amount of power with Job and limited his power. So we could see that. I have to wonder if that's why he didn't write it in there the way he did, that he limited Job's, or the devil's power all along the way. And, and yet... Darius saw the righteousness of Daniel, and he cared about him. How do we know he cared about him? When he left him in the lion's den, what did he do? He fasted all night. He stayed. He couldn't sleep and got early. He ran. He hurried down to the place to check, hey, has your God saved you? And that's what he had left him with when he closed up the place, said, may your God rescue you. So... You see that, and then you see Pilate. What did Pilate do? And it's carefully pointed out for us three times with regard to Jesus. He tried to get him released. He said, I find no fault in this man. Regardless of the accusations that were made against him, Pilate said, I don't find no fault. I, I don't find no, well, he wasn't from Oklahoma, so he wouldn't have said it like that. <laughs> uh, we'll just quote the scripture for that part. But yeah, that West Virginia. That's right. But that's, there's a parallel here. And it's like God says, I need somebody to stand up so that people can see. Even evil, wicked, heathen, pagan people see what's right. And that's the way it works in the world. By the way, if you ever want anybody to tell you how a Christian is supposed to behave, you just misbehave. And the whole evil, wicked, heathen, pagan world will say, well, Christians aren't supposed to do that. How do they say that? Because they know that. How do they know that? Because people know. Let your righteousness be a breastplate. That's what it was for Daniel. and No more for anybody than for Jesus. But it works for you and me that way too. Live the way you're supposed to live and as much as you possibly can. Marty, yes? It doesn't make any difference throughout history. 
It doesn't make any difference. We'll guide people all. Eventually, they always end up being victorious. Yes, always. It's, it's something you can... We don't get it perfect either. I, I try to be fair in all of my judgments of people because you have to judge people as, as you go through life to some degree. It's, it's not a practice that you embrace, but, but you have to do it. You have to decide if this mechanic you're talking to seems like a shyster or does he know what he's talking about? Is he going to treat me right? And it's nice today. You can get online, and what can you do online? You can look up reviews. See what other people have said, their testimony. That's why the law said two or three witnesses. You want to convict somebody, you've got to have two or three witnesses. And we've, we've got a book with 66 witnesses, in a sense, about how things are, what, what really is the truth. And so that's what we're looking at in this world. We're looking for the witness of what is right. And we see... You know, the founding fathers, talking about our nation and our government, they saw what was right, they put it down on paper, and we've been trying to live according to that as a nation. But within the nation, we have something infinitely higher than the nation's constitution. We've got the word of God, and we're trying to live according to the word of God within this nation. And... We should be loyal to our nation, but not ever to the point of going beyond anything the scriptures teach or letting any of our national pride substitute for the righteousness of the kingdom that we're supposed to be seeking first. All right, number five. No, we, that's what we've been doing, number five. Uh, diligence in prayer, courage, trust. Uh, he was consistent. In, in everything he did, regardless of what was put in front of him as to be a possible price. He stayed faithful. Number seven, other Bible characters with a strong prayer life are? Who can you think of that had a strong prayer life? Job. Hannah. Hannah prayed. She's the one from whom I get my personal definition for prayer. She poured out her soul to the Lord. That's, I think that's the best definition of prayer there is from Hannah. Who else? Strong prayer life. Who wrote most of the Psalms? A lot of those are prayers. David had a strong prayer life. Who's often called the son of David? I think Jesus kind of had a strong prayer life. And isn't that interesting? Son of God. Son of God. Eternal in his nature. And yet he prayed to God, and it's recorded in the Gospels several times how Jesus prayed to God and prayed alone by himself, prayed in the presence of people, even Jesus Christ. Fervently, yes, all night in prayer. When's the last time you spent all night in prayer? Paul, yes, I would say so. Another person who's often un unlooked, unlooked, Overlooked, Nehemiah. You read through Nehemiah and he's constantly praying and he's praying that God will forgive the sins of him and his people even though he wasn't around when those sins were committed back, back in the day. He's looking historically at the nation of Israel and talking to God about that and how upset he is about it. And yet he's the guy who goes back. He, he leads them back to rebuild the walls. But a lot of praying goes on when you read through Nehemiah. All right. What else in this account is worthy of our bringing up and talking about before our class time is concluded? Is there anything that strikes you about this whole thing? We've talked about the parallels between what happened with Daniel and what happened with Jesus the, the framing, the plot, because the only way they could find anything against him was with regard to his God, his practice before God. The king knew about that. What did he say? Your God, may he save you, the one you constantly serve. Dar Darius was seeing the service that Daniel was rendering to his God, and it wasn't obnoxious to him. 
it wasn't like, oh, this guy, he's, he's praise the Lord all the time. I get so tired of that. All, every day, all, when you're around him, he's just some kind of a crazy fanatical uh, God nut. No, that's not the way it was. Daniel was the kind of person who served his God, and it was obvious to Darius, but he didn't do it in an obnoxious way. He did it in some way that endeared him to, to Daniel, and Daniel was looking for leaders of the whole nation and was fixing, there's another, if he was in Oklahoma, that's how he'd have said it, he was fixing to put him in office over the whole kingdom. Preston? And I think about the simple question, where's Daniel now? Where is Darius now? Where's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego now? And it might say, well, what kind of a, well, they're, they're all dead and gone. And once you're dead and gone, only one thing matters. Do you have a relationship with God? We look at this world and you see the nation of Babylon and its power and its wealth. We see before them, it was another nation. After them, it was another nation. You know, the Medes and the Persians came. The, the Greeks came. We see the great uh, splendor uh, of Greek architecture and the ruins that even in their ruined state are magnificent. And you see the power of Rome. All that those nations have to offer combined the power of this nation, the wealth of this nation, it, it's nothing really because it's all coming to nothing. It will all burn up in the end and the only thing that will matter to you and to me is whether or not we have a relationship with God. Daniel had one. That made him a standout in this world and we know where he is with the Lord now. All the power that you can garner here it's not going to last. And I don't know if you've noticed it, but it seems to me that the people I see in this world who have all the power and all the wealth, a lot of them don't seem very happy. Uh, how many famous people can you read about who've committed suicide? Because as one man put it, it's not when you're in the gutter and you have nothing that you think life is meaningless. It's when you have everything that the world has to offer and you realize there's nothing in it. That's when you find out, oh, it is meaningless. I, I think about, and I'm not talking about, you, you start doing a little research. It's not obscure celebrities that you didn't even know were famous. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? You didn't even know they were famous. But I'm talking about really famous people that you would know that we would have thought in the world standards had it made and they killed themselves. Or they got into drugs and alcohol. Why do you get into drugs and alcohol? Because 
there's something in life that's missing and you're looking for something. People get into sex and crazy sexual things. Why? Because there's something in life that's missing and they're looking for something. And all of that stuff is destructive. All that stuff is harmful. It all looks good. It, it's like, you ever go to a, a restaurant and you see something pictured on the menu and, oh, man, that's gonna, I'm going to order that. And then you get that and it's like, oh, I, hmm, what did they cook this with? I, I thought this would be fill in the blank. And it's actually, you got another blank. That's the way the world is. Eve looked at that fruit. It was beautiful. It looked like it would be good to eat and it would really do something for her. And all it did was bring misery. And why did she eat the fruit? Because she listened to somebody tell her a lie about it. And nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. The world is exactly the same today. The world offers us its fruit and we're being told to lie. That's what you need right there. Oh man, if you had that. And how many times have we said, in, if I just had that, if I just made it to there, if I just could do this, my life would be perfect. And then you get there and, well, okay, what's the next thing I need? Oh, I guess that means we got to quit. Well, thank you all. Appreciate it. Lord, love you.